on this uh, Wesak day of uh, 2009, <coughs> we've all come together here to uh, listen to Dhamma, practice Dhamma together. On this beautiful, clear, full moon night. And uh, so I should uh, talk for a little bit about uh, what Waisak means and uh, why it's important, I guess. The birth, awakening and death of the Buddha. And of course, the... um, Birth and death are very common, aren't they? So we all get born and we all die. There's nothing particularly special about that. But it's the middle part, the awakening bit, which is a bit bit more elusive and uh, a bit harder to find in the world. Most of us are born stupid, grow old stupid and die stupid. (laughs) Buddha is born... I don't know if he was stupid when he was born, but he certainly wasn't enlightened anyway. I I think it's a bit heretical to say the Buddha was stupid when he was born. Anyway, he woke up. He became awake. This is what Buddhism is all about, awakening. And so the Buddha's life is... uh, uh, an example for us and a, a, a reminder, a, an inspiration that uh, awakening is possible. It's a reminder that in this world which has so much suffering, so much conflict, so much stress, that it is still possible to find peace. This is something that's real. <clears throat> And I guess this is an important part of the Buddha's message is that uh, peace uh, actually is the the highest reality or the highest truth. And sometimes we think of of peace as being something which is uh, an illusion or a um, uh, kind of a... um, uh, It's kind of airy-fairy or it's out there in the clouds or something like that. But Actually, according to Buddhism, the highest reality we call Nibbāna is nothing other than peace. And this is what the Buddha realized on that, that night <clears throat> two and a half thousand years ago when he became awakened. So when we look at the Buddha and the Buddha's life, when uh, this story is told uh, It's always uh, told, retold, reinvented uh, according to the the perspectives and the the wishes and needs of the teller. And down through the years, down through the millennia since the time of the Buddha, um, like any other uh, great spiritual leader, teacher, uh, the Buddha's life becomes wrapped and shrouded in mystery and mythology. Now that mystery and mythology is very, it's actually very beautiful. The Buddha's, the the myth of the Buddha's life is actually one of the most glorious uh, examples of of the way that myth develops uh, and uh, has a lot of very beautiful qualities to it. But it doesn't really tell us so much about the Buddha himself. It tells us about the people, the Buddhist communities, and what the Buddha meant to them. Okay, so it has its value from that from that point of view, but it tends to uh, sometimes obscure, or at least not particularly be be particularly illuminating to show actually about the Buddha himself. And so one thing from from my point of view, and I think it's quite common. Uh, in the, these days is we like to try to see if we can see through the mythology and see, see to it the actual man who was the Buddha. What was he like? What do we know about him? And when we do this, <coughs> uh, 
and if we take a, a kind of an investigative attitude to that and a, a, a slightly uh, critical or skeptical attitude towards the mythologies, then we find that very quickly most of the things that we've heard about the Buddha drop away. Okay? Most of the things which we see in the, uh, if you go into many Buddhist temples, you'll see the, the pictures on the walls uh, depicting the life of the Buddha and giving the examples, the episodes, the famous episodes. And most of those, when they're scrutinized in the light of reason and evidence, most of those tend to be a little bit um, not necessarily 100% plausible uh, as historical events. And if we're, we're left with the bare bones of what things that may, have, may actually be, be real events in the life of the Buddha, and I think those, those few little things that remain actually, to me, are very important. And to me, it's actually, I find it very moving that the, that the, the things which remain uh, are so, uh, to me, very powerful and very specific. So the first thing we, we, we're commemorating today is the Buddha's birth. Okay? Now, the Buddha was born in Lumbini, and this is uh, just uh, over the Nepalese border, nor just over the uh, border between Nepal and uh, northern India. And today is a very famous uh, park, a very famous pilgrimage site. And uh, I've been there a couple of times myself, and it's a, very, it's a very beautiful place to go to. And in that park, it has a uh, Ashoka pillar. So this is a pillar erected by King Ashoka about 200 years after the Buddha's um, death. And on that Ashokan pillar, it has an inscription. And the inscription uh, says, Iha Buddha Jate in the Magadhan dialect, which means here the Buddha was born. And uh, it says, among other things, it says that the local village was to be exempt from taxation because the, <laughs> the Buddha's uh, birthplace was there. And so uh, that's right there. So in the actual site itself, it says, Iha Buddha Jate. And that particular line, little phrase, is, is actually very interesting because that's almost a, a direct quote from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the, the discourse on the, the, the last days of the Buddha. And when the Buddha was, uh, shortly before he passed away, he said he encouraged people to go on pilgrimage to these holy sites. And when they go there, then they should reflect, here the Buddha was born. Okay, the same words, ida buddha jate. Yeah? Here the Buddha attained Parinibbana, here the Buddha became awakened. So I have the line in the Sutta, which is actually quoted more or less, in the inscriptions. And so it's possibly the oldest actual physical evidence of the Buddha's words there. And uh, so that, uh, it's a very inspiring uh, place to visit and to just contemplate that the Buddha was born there. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a problem, right? Because here we have perhaps the most serious concrete evidence that this is actually where the Buddha was born. Not in Buddha yet, he was Siddhartha there, but actually where he was born. But in recent years, there's actually been some skepticism expressed about this whole affair. And it seems that the, the fellow who, who first discovered the inscription was actually a, a known fraud who had actually faked other inscriptions, right? <laughs> And so there now seems to be a bit of a, a, a shadow looming over the whole Lumbini thing yeah, about whether it is actually the right place or not. So I don't have any particular opinions on that myself, but it's worth reflecting on because, you know, the, 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 um, uh, just to, to, to test ourselves and ask ourselves, well, where, is our faith, where does our faith lie? You know, what's, what's actually important to us? Is it really important that it was actually in that spot where the Buddha was born? Yeah? And in, actually in Lumbini now they actually have a plaque and they've now uncovered a plaque and they put a little plaque there. It says this is the exact spot where the Buddha was born, right? It was right on this piece of ground, right? Well, may it be so. What can you say? Yeah? That's terrific. But, uh, you know... And, of course, in the story of the Buddha's birth, 
mentions all of the usual kinds of miracles, the great light appearing in the sky and the devas coming and all of these kinds of things. And so the, those, there's no shortage of, of legendary um, ornamentation in the story. But of all of those uh, details, there's a few things about that which actually stand out as being likely to, to actually be the case. One of those things was that the Buddha's mother, Maya, was on the road from her, uh, her, her home in Kapilavatu, where she lived with uh, Suddhodana, the Buddha's father, back to her maternal home in Devadaha. Yeah? And so she was on that journey back home. Different Maya, okay? <laughs> and that's actually very common. It's actually a, a common custom in, in ancient India, and I believe still in, in some places today, that the mother before, who was pregnant before she gave birth would travel back to the maternal home. It seems like a bit of an inconvenient custom. And there's plenty of stories like this where they actually only got halfway and then uh, gave birth on the journey. Uh, and so she was on the way back to the maternal home. So this is probably you know, likely to be the case. But the other interesting thing about that is it's also a classic mythic motif yeah, is, is that the, the hero in, in a myth is very often born on a journey. I mean, Jesus was also born on a journey. Uh, Apollo and Leto and, and many, many of the, the, the heroes and so on were born in these kind of in-between place. So they're not born in one place or the other, but they're born somewhere in between. They're in a, they're in a place of potential rather than a place of uh, one decided settled place. So Maya, presumably her name is Maya, we, well, let's just assume for, for the sake of the story that her name's Maya, gives birth halfway, and then she died after seven days. Right? And so this is another one of the details which we have in the earliest texts, um, which seems to be both on textual grounds and also on just um, uh, historical grounds, seems to be quite uh, plausible, quite likely, and of course, in ancient times <coughs> and in much of the world still today, then childbirth was a very, very risky thing, and not at all uncommon for women to die of complications shortly after childbirth. So, uh, all the indications suggest that the Buddha's mother died shortly after he was born, and I personally, I think this is very um, significant. And, and I've, I've been kind of criticized for this, for, for, for bringing Western psychological concepts into the life of the Buddha where they don't belong. But I don't really think it's a Western psychological concept. I think that, that a baby who's deprived of their mother at a very early age, I think that it's going to have an impact on them. Yeah? And at that, that age, um, the infant is just, is like just starting or, or in, in, the, in, the, in the throes of, of beginning to form an idea of their mother. Yeah, their mother is like the source of life, the source of the milk, the source of love for them. And love is, is, is a uh, tremendous formative influence in the, 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 inf the baby's brain at that time and their whole body and everything is, being, is just being put together. The neurons are starting to all come together and the, the, the mind starting to form. And that time spent in the mother's arms, you know, suckling at the mother's breast, gazing into the mother's eyes, these are things which form the very basis for the, the personality of the infant and the very, the, their, their, uh, the, um, their, their, their initial experience of love and togetherness. It's a very, very powerful thing. And of course what happens for babies is that that, is, that can never be complete or total, that mother can never be there all the time, yeah? and she leaves, she walks out of the room. Now, from her point of view, the mother walks out of the room <laughs> just to go and do some weeding or to cook something or something like that, yeah? but from the baby's point of view, she's gone, right? and very young infants don't have what they call object permanence, right? so they don't understand that mum has gone, but she actually still exists, yeah? and she's going to come back. Right? From their point of view, she's just not there. Yeah? And so this is exactly what happened with the Buddha's mother. Yeah? She just disappeared and she didn't come back. Yeah? So he's just, you imagine that, just the infant, just starting to form this idea of love and togetherness. And then, then she's just not there. 
and there's, there's no possible way of comprehending what's happened. It's just there. It's just the, the experience of loss, and that's the first experience that we have for the Buddha that's got any plausibility historically. He lost his mother, yeah? and so I think that you know when we look at the Buddha's teachings, what did he teach about? Birth is suffering. Yeah? Yeah. Separation from the loved is suffering. Not getting what you want is suffering. Yeah? And this, I think this was a very powerful formative influence and a very, on a very deep subconscious level affected the Buddha uh, in later life. But that's, that's only a, a theory subject to um, just my own uh, feeling about the matter. So after he was born, then of course raised up by his auntie, um, Hapajapati in the home in Kapilavatu. Uh, he was part. He was a part of one of the the leading families there in the in the Shakyan clan, uh, the Gotama family, and the 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 king or the the the, the nation that he was part of, the Sakyan Republic, was run according to. What you might call, as might you might call, an aristocratic republic. So it was uh, uh, a, a little bit like ancient Greece, where where it was basically the landowners and the, and the chief families who would run the place together. It wasn't a monarchy, so you didn't have a king, but you'd have elected rulers who would who would uh, um, rule from for periods of time. But they didn't. It wasn't a full democracy in our sense. In the sense, they didn't have universal. Uh, enfranchisement, but it'd be like the, the ruling families would run the show. So he was brought up in one of these these leading families, and uh, according to all accounts, had a very luxurious upbringing. And in one sort of, he said all of his cloth, his robes were, were made, you know made of silk from Benares, and kind of, and uh, so he had these kind of, his, of course, his summer palace and winter palace and so on. So all of the the luxuries that that could be um, uh, expected in those days. Having said which, you know, it's still fairly mund mundane by today's standards, yeah? I mean, he didn't have MP3 players and he didn't have cars and he didn't have a lot of things that we take for granted, yeah? So actually his upbringing by our standards would still be quite simple. So what else do we know about his upbringing? The only, uh, there's only really one other episode or one other event in the Buddha's li early life which we know with any degree of probability happened. And that's when uh, uh, the occasion when he was sitting uh, underneath the, the rose apple tree and his father was away working. And he sat there very peacefully under that tree and then he went into what they call the first jhana, so a deep state of peaceful contemplation, meditation. This is a young child, the, the age not certain, but it seems maybe about nine or ten when that happened. But the particular event is recorded very, very widely in the Buddhist scriptures. Now, this particular event was critical in the Buddha's later d spiritual development. He recollected this episode shortly before his own uh, enlightenment. And uh, it obviously made a tremendous impression on him. You know, so we just try to, to imagine or just try to think of what was going on there. I find it curious or at least, at least worth remarking on the fact that, that what it actually says is, while my father was away working. Yeah? Okay, I find that quite an interesting kind of comment on a child's experience, isn't it? Yeah? It's quite a <laughs> major thing that most of us experience, isn't it? Well, well dad's away working. Yeah? So the father is absent. Yeah? So the first experience that we know is mum's absent. Second, second, only the second thing we know. Oh, while my father was away working. Yeah? And just sitting peacefully, I went into jhana. Now, you know, just, just now we were doing our circumnambulation around the oval and uh, walking around there. It's very, you can see how it's, it's very peaceful, wasn't it? It's a very peaceful occasion. It was the... The nature, the, the grass, uh, the clear sky, the, the moon there and so on. And when we, we put ourselves into those kinds of environments, then it just very naturally starts to make our mind peaceful. Yeah? I could, and I could certainly feel that myself as we were doing that 
as we went around one or two times and you gradually just feel it's becoming more and more peaceful with that. And this is why we go to you know, sit by the ocean and just watch the waves coming in and out. You know, this is why we go to the park and walk through the park. It just, just makes us peaceful. And so this is what happening to, to Siddhartha as a child, just sitting and he wasn't doing meditation. He wasn't, you know, he didn't have a system. He didn't have a, a dogma or a theory or a doctrine. He was just sitting peacefully with nature in that beautiful place. And then his mind just went into that experience. Personally, I think this is probably not all that uncommon. Yeah. I don't think it happens to everyone, but you know, if I look back at my life, I can think of some times when I was a child and, and just being in some kind of environment, maybe just looking at the stars or something, and you really start to feel that very deep sense of peace coming. And you can really appreciate, oh yeah, if, you know, if that process was to go on and become deeper and deeper, then that could go into that kind of deep contemplation. So that experience as a child, in a sense, it didn't have any context. So when it happened to him, he didn't have any way of understanding it. It just happened. Yeah, it's just one of those things. And, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe, um, <coughs> you know, be quite, you know, startling or, or um, impressive at the time. But because you don't understand it, you don't have a context, then maybe you don't, think about it too much or make too much of it. It's just something that happens. So then Siddhartha grew up and uh, <coughs> lived at home until he was 29. And again, almost everything that we know about uh, him from that age is all a product of later legends. Uh, according to the stories, he was married. It doesn't seem at all implausible to say that he was, he was married. Uh, and yet, we n really know little to nothing about the Buddha's wife. We don't really even know her name. And uh, I've done a little bit of scouting around in the, the various Buddhist texts, and there's certainly well over a dozen names recorded for the Buddha's wife. You know, Yashodara or Yashovati or Bimba, Bimba Devi, or Sundara, Bimba, Bimba Sundara, Badakachana, and uh, so on and so forth. In the earliest text, she's simply called Rahula Mata, which means the mother of Rahula. Yeah? And so Rahula is the Buddha's son, so Rahula's mother. So we really know little about these people. They're almost, the, they're as, as they're almost like, um, almost like um, illusions, or they just, they're just like part of a magic show. They just have a, have a role to play, you know, someone who's there to fulfill the role of the Buddha's wife. But... We don't really know about her, yeah. And uh, of course, the 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 critical juncture that happened in the Buddha's life was when he left home. And again, there's many legends about this this leaving home, but there's only a few things that we have in the early text. One of them it says, "Mata pitunang rudantanang." Says, although my mother and father wept with tears running down their faces. So there was obviously some stress there with that. And of course, that's very understandable. Yeah? When uh, someone's son or daughter wants to leave the home uh, and go into the wilderness and into the unknown, then it can be quite distressing for the parents. How did the Buddha's wife feel? We don't know. There's nothing in the early texts. Perhaps the very silence is the most eloquent thing. Uh, later uh, texts have her uh, suffering greatly from that and from Siddhartha's opportunity. In one version, uh, she discovers him just as he's about to leave home. And uh, she just looks at him, you're going to leave, aren't you? He says, yes. And then she says to him, Take me to that place that you're going. And he said, I will. And then he left. Yeah. And 
many years later, of course, after he realized awakening, then he did come back and uh, he did take his wife to that place where he'd gone. So according to the tradition, his wife later became a, a nun and realized full awakening herself. Yeah? So that place that he'd gone to, she also found that place as well. So this is very, uh, a very moving and quite a, uh, quite a um, dramatic episode in the Buddha's life. You know, we, we look to the Buddha as a moral example, right? This is one of the things the Buddha is. He's, he's an example for our lives. And yet he abandoned his family. Is that supposed to be an example for us? Right? That's what we're supposed to do on Vesak, everyone. Okay, abandon your family. And Buddhism has been criticized for this. Yeah? In the Buddha's own day, they were criticized for breaking up families. And later on in China and other places as well, this is a common criticism. And uh, so one can, can read this or interpret this in a number of ways. <coughs> One thing always to, what, 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 what I think that means is, you know, on, on, a, on a deep level, as a story, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an episode in that, that myth or the, the legend of the Buddha, what that is about, it's about um, like almost like forcing, like the, the very drama and the very uh, pain of that forces our minds into... Uh, like it levers our minds up into a new uh, level or system of values. Yeah? It doesn't it doesn't devalue or demean the value of the home life. Yeah? So it's not it's not about saying that that there was anything wrong with that, but it's about saying that there is another set of values which transcends that. Yeah? And so by the, the very the very uh, trauma of that event is necessary to get us to to consider or to move to that uh, higher set of values. And of course, underlying that all is the experience that the Buddha had when after his, after his birth and his mother passed away. A separation is inevitable anyway. Right? It's just a matter of time. Yeah? So we're all going to be separated from those that we love anyway, no matter what we do. And so that's trying to solve that problem. And so no matter uh, when we think of that, uh, that pain and that suffering, so without diminishing the pain and the suffering of all the parties in that, there's, as well as that, it's also true that uh, they also, all of them achieve great bliss and great peace. And not only that, but many others have as well. So this is one of the interesting paradoxes that lies really at the heart of the, the Buddha's legend. So he left home. Why did he leave home? Did he just have an argument with the missus? Right? Did he, did he just not want to face the hassles of trying to be a father? Yeah. Uh, again, the early texts aren't particularly clear on that, but there's one particular sutta which is, is, gives a very nice um, description on that where he actually talks about it himself and says, this is the reason why I went forth. And, uh, of course, many of you may have heard the legend of the, the divine messengers and going out and seeing the old man, the sick man, the, the dead man, uh, and the monk, and then deciding to go forth out of seeing, after seeing these signs. And that's not found in the earliest strata of the text. But the, the earliest occasion, he says that the thing that really prompted him to want to go forth was uh, conflict and violence. Yeah? He had seen uh, people taking up weapons against each other. Yeah? And he could see how uh, it seemed to be impossible for people to, to be able to live at peace. Yeah? And, he, and he used this very, I find a very, very striking image. He said, like, like um, fish floundering around in too little water. Yeah? Macho apodikeyata, just floundering around without any water. And so he saw people like that just floundering around, uh, uh, um, with animosity and, and, and enmity towards each other. And so he said, I tried to find somewhere that would be safe. Where can I find that safe? Where can I find that there's a refuge? Yeah? And he said, I can't find anywhere. Yeah, everywhere in the world I look, it's the same. I can't find anywhere that's really a place of safety. 
and then he says, Diswa Mang Bahemavisi, when I saw that, fear came upon me. Yeah, he was terrified. And so then he said, well, what's the cause of this? Where does this all come from? Why are people unable to find at peace? Why, when we all love peace and longing for it, do we actually live in conflict? And then he looked and he said, the, the answer lies in the heart. He said, there's this, there's this, there's this arrow of craving and attachment, which is in the heart. And it's hidden there so deeply that you can hardly see it. Duddhasang harayanisikang. So it's only when we can learn to pluck that arrow out that we can finally be at peace. So he went forth and practiced in the jungles of uh, the Ganges Valley for um, six years. Uh, practiced with the various yogis and ascetics from the different religious traditions. And as everyone knows, India is famous for its diverse and very colorful spiritual traditions and uh, no less diverse and colorful in the Buddha's day than it is today. Uh, after all of that, he learnt something from each place he'd been, but ultimately he rejected all of those practices and went off to practice by himself. And uh, even though he'd done a lot of uh, uh, self-mortification, bodily torment, tried following the practices that were current in the time to try to torture his body into submission, eventually he realised that all of those things were useless. He hadn't got, them, got him anywhere. And then he recollected the time when he was sitting uh, as a child and went into the first jhana. Yeah? So that time when he just sat and naturally went into quiet contemplation, found deep peace of mind, just through the peace of nature. And he said, well, maybe that could be the way to awakening. Yeah? And then this, this int in intuition arose in him, just this intuitive knowledge, intuitive awareness, that is the path to awakening. Eso vamago bodhaya. That is the path to awakening. So then he came to uh, Bodhgaya and uh, found the uh, um, place to sit at the uh, where the Bodhi tree is today. Uh, and the stupa there, some of you I'm sure have been there. And uh, if you haven't, then you should go. It's a very, very beautiful, very powerful, very inspiring place. According to the Buddhist tradition, it's the, the, the navel of the universe. Yeah? The spiritual center of the entire cosmos is centered at Bodh Gaya. Yeah? Uh, but the Buddha's own description was a bit more humble. He said there was a, a, a lovely, clear, flowing stream, uh, a gently receding banks with grass on them, uh, and a nice place to sit. It was very beautiful. And nearby there was a village. I could go for alms to the village. And I thought, this is, this is good enough for meditation. Yeah? So I think this is also quite nice, you know, to sort of contrast the, the sort of mythic perception in the Buddhist tradition. It's the kind of the navel of the universe and this kind of whole cosmic thing. And the Buddha's thing was, well, it's quite a pleasant little place. It's good enough for meditation. It doesn't have to be the navel of the universe. Just it has to be good enough for meditation, yeah? So he sat there. And... According to the traditions, he meditated all night. And uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, the um, process of enlightenment or awakening was uh, described in many different ways in different places. Okay? So it's, it's, it's obviously a, 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 um, an experience of unfathomable wisdom and of uh, uh, ir irreducible profundity. So we can't hope to capture that and sort of reduce it and put it into just a formula and think that we've understood it. Okay? Uh, so this, for this reason, it's depicted from many different perspectives, many different ways of looking at it. But one of the important ways of looking at it is in terms of the threefold knowledge. And so I'll just, just describe that briefly for now. And the three, threefold knowledge, the Te Vidya, uh, as the Buddha described it, he realized in the three watches of the night. So the first watch of the night, just between 6 and 10 in the evening, he recollected his past lives. 
and so this process went, uh, it's not a process of a kind of vague, um, you know, awareness or impression of something like that, but a very clear analytical process based on an experience of deep meditation, deep samadhi, and to recollect he's born in different places and so on in his past lives. And <coughs> the purpose of this really, or what this revealed to him, was um, the, the length and depth of this thing we call sangsara. Okay? So according to Buddhism, this life is not the only one. According to Buddhism, we have a stream of lives, one after the other, after the other, after the other, endlessly rolling on. And so this was the first time when the Buddha sort of, he would have heard of these ideas in the culture around, but this is the first time he experienced that knowledge in being able to see for himself. One of the interesting things about, uh, if you look at modern research into past lives, is that uh, <coughs> there, was a there was a very large scale study done uh, on hypnotic regression in past lives uh, in England. And I think they, they tested more than a thousand people. And there were some very interesting aspects to that. But one of the most interesting aspects was simply uh, how mundane everybody's life was. Okay, you know, you'd expect everyone would going to be Cleopatra or something like that in their past life, but no, everyone basically everyone was farmers. You know, maybe eighty or ninety percent of people said in the past lives they were farmers, and their what was their life? Plowing fields. Yeah, what did they eat? Porridge. Yeah, plain bread. Yeah, out of a, a rough wooden bowl. Yeah, and so their lives are actually very mundane and very 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 dull most of the time, and uh, so. Uh, in the, the, this is what the Buddha was seeing. He said, "Well, life is, in a sense, life is limited. Yeah? Life is, life is. Um, uh, it can pro provide certain kind of uh, pleasure or satisfaction and gratification, but that's all, all limited. And so he's now seen that for the first time, how that it just keeps on going in these cycles again and again and again. Second watch of the night between ten in the evening and two o'clock in the morning, most of us are starting to sort of nod and fall asleep if we're trying to meditate at that time. But the Buddha, because of the power of his mind, the power of his samadhi, then moved on to the next knowledge, which was seeing beings being born and passing away according to their karma. Now, what this is showing is not merely the fact that we have these different past lives and so on, but that it's actually caused according to our acts and our choices. It's not something which we are forced into. It's not, a, it's not a destiny. It's our choice. We do good, we, we, go, we experience happiness. We're born in a good place. We do bad, we're born in a bad place. Now, this is a very complex thing. It's not a simple, it's a, it's a simple principle, yeah? but the ramifications of it are very complex. Yeah? Because, obviously, during our life, we do many good things and many bad things. We make many good choices and many bad choices. So the way that plays out is, of course, very complex. And so the Buddha, again, spent time to sort of investigate this and its many ramifications and so on, to be able to understand the principle. And then in the third watch of the night, he found the escape. Yeah? He found the thing that would untie that process of samsara, yeah? would untie the knot. Okay? And that is, as I mentioned earlier, is the plucking out of the dart of craving, realizing that this whole round of what we call samsara is driven by our own attachments, our own desires, and so on. It's our own choices. That's why we suffer. We suffer because of our own choice. If we, once we pluck that out, once we let go of that desire, once we let go of that attachment, once we let go of that conceit, of the idea I am, then we find peace. And so as the sun rose on that morning, uh, according to the traditions, the, the Buddha realized the, the final awakening uh, with the arising of the sun. So that's half the story. Yeah? Now, according to the Buddhist tradition, there are many sages 
who can real who maybe realize the truth through their practice and so on, and they're called Pacheka Buddhas. Yeah, they 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 realize the truth, but they don't really do very much about it. They just they just live peacefully and happily themselves. Yeah, but they don't really share that with others, or only to a limited degree. And the Buddha was kind of tempted down that road after his his uh, awakening. He thought. Why bother trying to teach this stuff? Yeah? People are just not going to get it. Yeah? They've just got too much stuff going on in their minds, too much desires, attachments, all of these things. I'd be much more, be much more peaceful just to sit here and do my meditation and live a nice quiet life rather than having to go through all that hassle. Yeah? Two things he said were very hard to see. Dependent origination and Nibbana. Yeah? He said these things, I can't teach, it's very hard to teach these two things. Yeah? So I think we can probably all agree that <laughs> this was all true, yeah? It is true, we have lots of defilements, yes, it's true. Seeing the Dhamma is hard. And those two things, dependent origination and Nibbana, are particularly hard. So uh, he changed his mind, thankfully. And again, according to the story, uh, Brahma, the... Uh, God Brahma came and begged him to teach. And whether that episode happened or not is uh, a matter for faith, but the, what is certain is that he did decide to teach uh, and then spent the next <coughs> 45 years bringing his message across to people. Now, the, the story of how that happened is, is, is occasion for another uh, uh, talk, but what um, what I think is, is um, for me, uh, very uh, inspiring and outstanding about that process and about what happened then is, is if we look at, uh, at least for myself, I've always been very inspired by the, 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 early, the early teachings of the Buddha in the Pali Canon and other early literature. And one of the, the, the qualities of those, that teaching and that Dhamma is something which is not easy to uh, pin down or to, um, uh, not easy to, to, to recognize, but it's, it's something about, there's a certain evenness to it, a certain balance and a certain uh, kind of an effortlessness to it where the Buddha was, would respond in so many different situations over such a long period of time, you know, he, sometimes he'd be threatened and challenged and had all of these different challenges in so many different ways. And in every case, he just handled himself with his dignity and in a way that was appropriate to the situation. You know, sometimes he would be quite stern and firm if that was necessary. Sometimes he would have this kind of gentle sense of humor when that was appropriate. Sometimes he would cut through to the heart of things and just say a, a few words that would cut through to someone's problem. And in another case, he would teach in great detail and great depth. And so, but, but all the way through, there's this sense of uh, appropriateness and sense of ease to what he was doing. And of course, he was very successful as a spiritual teacher during his life. Many enlightened disciples, monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, and towards the end of his life, it came to time for him to pass away. And he was traveling uh, from uh, Radhigaha north across the Ganges River to the Vajian Republic and uh, north of uh, Patna today, near Vesali, and uh, passed away in Kusinara uh, in between the twin Sala trees. And uh, again, you know, so some of the, the in that period in that story, it's a very very moving discourse about the, the last days of the Buddha, uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. If you do get the chance to read it, that would, it's, a, it's a very I find it very moving. And in that Sutta, we find some of the most human portrayals of the Buddha, uh, sort of sitting in the sun, warming his back in the last rays of the sun. He, he, he said the Buddha had a bad back. I find this very reassuring. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so he's just sitting gently warming his son in the in the warming his back in the rays of the sun. Yeah, and uh, 
and then as he came time for him to pass away and, and lying down between the twin sala trees and even right up to that moment just still just only thinking of the, the benefit of everyone yeah and then just trying to do what's 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 going to be best for for all the people and he says okay is there anyone who has any doubts about my teaching you're you're sure you're confident what you want to do and there's a hundreds of people all around yeah he says please tell me if there's anybody who has any doubts then let me know everyone's silent and he says well maybe you're you're just too nervous to ask so if you're too nervous to say anything then let a friend tell a friend yeah tell your friend your friend can ask for you yeah very very beautiful yeah just that that, that little gesture that just to go that extra extra little bit to to help people but nobody had any questions at that time. They were all very s advanced in their spiritual practice. They'd had their opportunity to ask the questions and they'd had their doubts answered. So they all kept silent. And so the Buddha gave some, some last minute instructions to the uh, Sangha, to the community. And then finally, he said his last words, Vaya Dhamma Sankara Atamadena Sampadeta. And those those that little phrase, quite, I think, I find very, very extraordinary, um, encapsulates uh, the whole of the Buddha's teaching just in, in four words. Right? So it's just four words in Pali. Vayadhamma Sankara. It means, the literal translation you say is that conditioned thing, conditioned phenomena are subject to decay. Right? So that's the kind of Buddhist hybrid English translation. Right? But in, in actual English, what it means is things fall apart. Yeah, so that's the, that's the actual English translation. Things fall apart. Why Dhamma Sankara? Conditions deteriorate. And so this sums up the Buddha's teaching, and of course sums up that experience, which had been his experience since his birth. Yeah, his first experience. His mother disappears. Why Dhamma Sankara? Yeah. And then the second part of his teaching, Apamadena Sampadeta. Strive on with diligence. So our response to that, our response to the impermanence, the uncertainty, the fear, the danger of the world, uh, is not, uh, you know, hedonism. It's not despair. It's not sort of clinging or attaching to some kind of idea or anything like that. But it's to strive with diligence yeah, and to to recognize what is our spiritual path and to really put our heart and our soul into that practice, to apply ourselves to that with the best that we can possibly do. That's what Apamadena Sampadeta means. To do that spiritual practice as best as we possibly can and to never give up. And so with that, those last words, the Buddha then... Uh, uh, went into deep meditation and uh, from that state of deep meditation from the fourth jhana he then uh, uh, passed away attained parinibbana and after that <coughs> the mystery deepens yeah where did he go from there yeah does he exist does he not exist does he both exist and not exist or neither exist nor not exist this is one of the things which is very uh, mysterious. And uh, as the Buddha explained, he said, this is one of the hardest things to teach is about Nibbana. So that, that goal of escape, liberation, freedom, we call Nibbana, that the Buddha attained to. We're always left uh, um, uh, we, you know, we can, we can say like it's the ending of suffering or we can say it's the uh, uh, the ending of greed hatred and delusion yeah so we can express it in these ways and give some meaning to it but the actual the thing itself what it is is very very hard to encapsulate what we do know though is that nobody's complained about it yet okay <laughs> so nobody's asked for their money back all right nobody's as far as i'm aware has realized nibbana and said is that all that's rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so 
uh, if we have faith, then uh, we can see Nibbana as a, uh, a very beautiful goal to strive for. And that, that, that peace, uh, and I hope that, that, you know, as we're doing our circumnambulation earlier, that uh, all of you could feel some kind of peace from that gentle activity that we do together. Now, that peace that we experience there through that Buddhist practice is not different from the peace of Nibbana. Yeah? It's the same thing. Nibbana is just the perfection of that. It's the same peace. Nibbana is the perfection of that. And so that ultimately is the, the meaning of the Buddha's life. Yeah? That Nibbana is peace. And if that's what we're searching for, if that's what we want, then the Buddhist way uh, will lead us to that. So this is my talk for you this evening on uh, Waisak, the Buddha's birth, awakening, and passing away. And I offer this for your reflection and uh, amusement. And if anyone has any comments or questions.